From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! On the brink of civil war, it is scary. And I hope that everyone who is responsible for making decisions at the moment, I mean both the Ukrainian authorities, who we can't consider legitimate, but these are the authorities who came to power as a result of a coup, have brains to avoid driving the country to such shocks. As negotiations begin in Geneva, three pro-Russian protesters are killed by Ukrainian security forces in the eastern part of Ukraine. As NATO builds up its forces in the region and Vladimir Putin asserts the right to use force in Ukraine, are we seeing a new Cold War? We'll speak with Professor Stephen Cohen, then fixing the Electoral College. All of a sudden, uh, we have no more battleground states, we have no more spectator states. We just have a, we have a real national election, which in the whole history of this country, we've never, ever had. Momentum for a national popular vote grows as New York Governor Andrew Cuomo signs a compact to award the state's electoral votes to the presidential candidate who receives the majority of the popular vote. We'll speak with New Yorker magazine writer Hendrik Hertzberg. Then new details emerge about the key role of the Air Force in the CIA's secret overseas drone war. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Russia and Ukraine are slated to hold their first direct talks today amidst rising unrest. In an overnight clash, Ukrainian security forces killed three pro-Russian separatists, wounded 13, and took 63 captive after the separatists tried to storm a military base. The fighting comes just after the collapse of a Ukrainian operation to retake government buildings in several towns. Separate to seize Ukrainian armored vehicles and crowds surrounded another column, forcing troops to hand over the pins from their rifles and retreat. The developments come as four-party talks begin in Geneva today between Russia, Ukraine, the European Union and the United States. We'll have more on this story after headlines. The Syrian government is facing new allegations of using chemical weapons against civilians. Videos posted online show what appears to be victims of a chlorine gas attack in the northern Syrian town of Kafrizita. The Assad regime and opposition rebels have each accused the other side of responsibility. Al-Qaeda in Yemen has released a new video threatening attacks on the United States. The video features footage of what appears to be large Al-Qaeda gathering with hundreds welcoming the release of prisoners freed in a jailbreak. A group representing Detroit public employees has accepted cuts to their pensions as part of the negotiations around the city's attempted bankruptcy. The board of Detroit's general retirement system has approved a deal that would cut pensions by 4.5 percent and scrap cost-of-living increases. This comes after retired police officers and firefighters accepted a more favorable deal that left pensions untouched. Together, the two groups represent about 23,000 of the 30,000 and public workers who face threats to their retirement benefits following the bankruptcy filing by Detroit's emergency manager last year. Detroit's bankruptcy effort is the largest by a municipality in U.S. history. New figures show deportation cases in the nation's immigration courts are on the decline. The New York Times reports court-ordered deportations have dropped 43 percent since President Obama took office in 2009. The Obama administration's brought 26 percent fewer cases since its first year, and immigration judges have increasingly ruled against deportations. The courts only account for a portion of the deportations, and the overall number of deportations dropped just 10 percent in 2013 from the year before. President Obama <clears throat> has deported an estimated 2 million people, the most by any administration in history. Philadelphia has announced it will no longer detain undocumented immigrants for transfer to federal authorities without a court warrant. The move by Mayor Michael Nutter sharply cuts cooperation between Philadelphia police and Immigration and Customs Enforcement on holding detainees for potential deportation. Nutter signed the policy into law at a news conference Wednesday. Every Philadelphian or person in Philadelphia has the right to feel safe, secure, and protected. And I believe that our new policy established by the executive order I will sign shortly 
will promote safety because residents and others who are here will not need to fear that interacting with their government will result in a detainer for themselves or their loved ones. Similar curbs have been enacted for two states and at least eight cities, but activists say Philadelphia's effort may be the most progressive so far, since it would effectively bring immigration holds to an end. A federal judge has overturned North Dakota's anti-abortion law, the harshest in the country. The measure banned abortion once a fetal or embryonic heartbeat can be detected, which happens at about six weeks of pregnancy, when many women do not know they're pregnant. It was slated to take effect in August. In this decision, District Court Judge Daniel Hovland said the law is invalid and unconstitutional. General Motors is asking court to shield it from legal liability for all conduct predating its 2009 bankruptcy. A motion filed this week seeks recognition of the split from old GM into the post-bankruptcy new GM. If approved, GM's request could protect it from claims over the defective ignition switch linked to at least 13 and possibly hundreds of deaths. General Motors knew of the defect for over a decade, but only issued a recall earlier this year. The company's request was disclosed in a federal lawsuit filed in Texas over the defect. In its court motion, GM says, quote, just like the other ignition switch actions that other plaintiffs have filed in the wake of public reports regarding the outstanding recall. This case relates to a vehicle designed, manufactured, originally sold, and advertised by old GM, unquote. GM has yet to reply to dozens of questions about the defects submitted by the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration earlier this month. The auto giant is paying a $7,000 fine for each day. It fails to provide the answers in full. At a news conference, GM CEO Mary Barra denied that the company is stonewalling. We work on those every day. Some of the questions are, are really dependent to have the full, complete answer on getting through the investigation. But we are trying to be as responsive as possible, Have, but we will not sacrifice the accuracy and the right detail of the answers, because it's very important. This is a very um, complex situation. It's very important. But we are working on it uh, with a dedicated team that works around the clock to, to provide the answers to NHTSA. President Obama spoke at a community college in Pennsylvania Wednesday to unveil a job training and placement initiative for young workers. Obama pledged $500 million to colleges that help students find jobs and another $100 million for apprenticeship grants. Seamless progression from community college programs to industry-recognized credentials and credit towards a college degree. And today I'm announcing that we're going to award nearly $500 million to those institutions who are doing it best in all 50 states, using existing money to create opportunity for hardworking folks like you. Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg has launched a new gun control group aimed at taking on the NRA. Bloomberg's committed $50 million to funding Every Town for Gun Safety, a grassroots group of voters against gun violence. Lisa Wheeler-Brown, a Florida mother who lost her child to a shooting, and Seattle Mayor Ed Murray were among those to join the group's unveiling. Someone murdered my son with an illegal weapon, so I'm going to do all I can to prevent another mother from losing a child to gun violence. Today we are announcing Every Town for Gun Safety, a new organization that brings mayors, moms, and the grassroots movement of Americans together to deal with the issue of gun violence. Gun violence kills 86 Americans every day. It happens everywhere, in big cities, small towns, on our streets, schools, shopping malls, and places of worship. The Senate Intelligence Committee has opened a probe of a leak that revealed details of its report on CIA torture. McClatchy reported last week the report questions the program's underlying legal framework and accuses the agency of impeding its overseers and manipulating the media. Panel chair Diane Feinstein says she's asked the Justice Department to investigate how McClatchy obtained the information. A federal appeals courts upheld a contempt of court ruling against the technology firm LavaBit, which shut down rather than disclose information to the U.S. government. LavaBit closed its secure email service after refusing to comply with a government effort to tap his customers' encryption keys. The FBI was targeting national security agency leaker and LavaBit user Edward Snowden. But instead of just targeting Snowden, the government effectively wanted access to the accounts of four 
400,000 other LavaBit customers. In his ruling, federal judge Stephen Agee avoided ruling on the merits of LavaBit's claims, instead saying the company made an error in its appeal. To see our interviews with the founder of LavaBit, you can go to democracynow.org. Edward Snowden was a surprise questioner today at a televised call-in show hosted by Russian President Vladimir Putin. Putin spent much of the broadcast fielding questions on the crisis in Ukraine. But Snowden asked Putin if Russia is engaged in the same mass surveillance practices that Snowden exposed in the United States. Now, I've seen little public discussion of Russia's own involvement in the policies of mass surveillance. So I'd like to ask you. Does Russia intercept, store, or analyze in any way the communications of millions of individuals? And do you believe that simply increasing the effectiveness of intelligence or law enforcement investigations can justify placing societies rather than subjects under surveillance? Thank you. Our intelligence efforts are strictly regulated by our law, so how special forces can use this kind of special equipment as they intercept uh, phone calls or uh, follow someone online, and you have to get a court permission to stalk a particular person. We don't have a mass uh, system of such interception. And according to our law, with our law, uh, it cannot exist. We do not have a mass scale, uncontrollable efforts like that. I hope we won't do that, and we don't have as much money as they have in the States, and we don't have these technical devices that they have in the States. Our special services, uh, thanks God, are strictly controlled by the society and by the law and are regulated by the law. That was Russian President Vladimir Putin ask, answering the question of Edward Snowden, who called in to his talk show. And the salsa and bolero singer Cheo Feliciano has died at the age of 78. He was killed early this morning in a car cow crash in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Born in Puerto Rico, Feliciano moved to New York City and started out as a percussionist before going on to sing with the Joe Cuba Sextet and later the Eddie Palmieri Orchestra. Last year, Feliciano announced he'd been diagnosed with a treatable form of cancer. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world.